so far as we've wended our way around through this material, what we've done is we've kind of looked at a population with the Z test and samples with the T test. And within samples, we, we looked at independent groups versus dependent groups. Okay, so we've kind of worked our way to that. And those are like the three kind of pillars, if you will, of what most people do in, in, in research, right? They don't do a lot of complicated things. When you boil it down to its most basic elements, it's a control versus an experimental group, right? Or it's an experimental group versus a control. And then there can be some variations on a basic theme on that. Okay, having said that, uh, the other thing that's very common is that we do an analysis looking at more than two groups, looking at more than a control group versus an experimental, looking at more than a dependent sample or, an, or two independent samples, okay? So there's a lot more going on. Sometimes what they do, well, most of the times what they do, and this is the most meat and potatoes analysis you're going to see in the literature, is the introduction to analysis of variance. And I'm not gonna read this chart, but I'm gonna see, tell you what analysis of variance is. When we do research, what do we always try to capture? We always try to capture as much variance as we can, okay? That's what makes the model run. The differences or the variance between the control and the experimental, the differences between the two, two dependent samples, the difference between the two independent samples, well, that's only two groups and that's pretty limited. That's what we kind of call the univariate analysis. But what if I have more than two groups? What if I'm looking to compare the drug use on a, a particular drug with three different dosage levels, low, medium, and high? And I wanna compare them all together, okay? So the sages of statistics came up with a methodology to look at all three of those conditions at the same time. And the words that we use to say when we talk about them all at the same time, we look at them and we say that it is that we analyze the three groups simultaneously. All right, so you kind of so you have to kind of visualize for a second. I have low, medium, and high, and then I I want to look at is there a difference between low and medium, low and high, medium and low, medium and high, right? All three combinations. Okay, I can I can do that using a t-test. See, here's three different samples here uh, or populations. I can use that, I can do that during using a t-test, but there's going to be a problem. So here we have these folks, these folks, this is low, medium, and high. They get whatever treatment it is at that dosage level. I take down their information just as we've always done, because we always know we need to have a sum of squares. Okay, and then we're gonna take that sums of squares and we're gonna do different things, okay? So we have three different groups that we're looking together. That's what analysis of variance is. Z and T are one group versus another group. This is three. Now, can I do a T test with three groups and three different, you know, and using all the combinations, one versus two, one versus three, two versus three. Can I do that? Yes, absolutely. But what is the problem? A problem becomes what they call error-wise treatment effects. Basically, we have our error term. When we do 95 times out of 100, we still have 5% of we don't know what's going on. So if we start to do combinations, a t-test between one and two, one and three, and two and three, we're inflating that error term, okay? And what happens is it's like the, the, the guided imagery that I use on that is that if you have a hole in the ceiling and it's drip, drip, dripping and you put a bucket in there and you look at it for 10 minutes, you have like four drops, five drops. But overnight, what happens? You have a gallon's worth of water. OK, so it's death by a thousand little needles. So the purpose of using analysis of variance is to look at three or more groups. And here's the important word simultaneously or at the same time together. Okay, so I wanna compare these three different populations or samples all at the same time under the same microscope or the same lens, if you will. Now, analysis of variance is kind of a modern day kind of thing where uh, 
where there's really not a lot of uh, the terminology is, you know, it's kind of made up a little bit. So having said that, we need to look at a number of things. Look at, let's look at factor levels and factorial design. And I'm gonna break it down and I'm, gonna, I'm going to make it really, really very basic here because this is really at the end of the day what you need to know. Once again, I'm not gonna read these, uh, this slide, I'm just gonna to talk to it. A factor, all you need to know about a factor is that the factor is the independent variable. So if we're looking at my ridiculous headache study, Right, we have three different dosages of, of medication, one aspirin, two aspirin, three aspirin, okay? That would be my factor. Aspirin would be my factor because it's an independent variable. What do they mean by quasi? That would mean, to, it, it doesn't matter. That's what I was talking about. If we're looking to put a stop sign up or putting up a light. So guess what? That would be, we don't know how many cars would go through. So that would be quasi. I can't control everything in my independent variable. But I want you to remember that a factor is the independent variable. So when you're reading a research article, especially in the abstract, they'll say an analysis of variance was performed and the factors are or were. Okay, so now you know what they're talking about. Levels, well, that's pretty much pretty basic. Levels, low, medium, and high, okay? Uh, different shades of blue. It doesn't matter whatever that particular level is. And they'll tell you that, they'll say the levels were included this, did not excluded that, included something else, okay? And then they start to talk about something and make things even more complicated by talking about things uh, such as factorial design. I don't want you to start, I, I'm gonna explain what a factorial design is, but it's not going to. It's not the most critical element of the two of the terminology. All the factorial design means is that you have two or more independent variables at play. Okay, so I can have so an independent variable would be aspirin versus Tylenol and the levels. All right, so that would be two things. And the factorial design. I know it's going to be. Oh, it's going to start to get confusing. The factorial design just kind of develops a method to say, what's the best way for me to present, you know, for the combinations, which combinations are the most common ones that I need. So don't even get involved with that. Once you see factorial design, all you need to know that it's multiple independent variables. And those independent variables will be listed as factors. Okay, I hope that's pretty clear as best it can be. And here, it starts to get, and we're gonna to start to see some complexity be, being put onto things, such as here's the null hypothesis and the null is easy. It's the mean of one equals the mean of two and equals the mean of three. And as I always say, it's not that they're equal to each other. It means that there is not a significant difference between the three different groups we're analyzing simultaneously, okay? Now it gets to be a little bit more problematic is the alternate <clears throat> because we have so many combinations and it becomes quite wordy. Excuse me for a second. Oh man, oh, so dry. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, so all we do is for the uh, alternate hypothesis, we just put down not null because we're not gonna sit down and put down many different uh, combinations. So if we have two independent variables and three levels within each, that's a lot of combinations. <clears throat> and, we, and we're gonna save a tree on that, okay? So that's what we do, we put down not, not null. And as we go through and we start to wend our way through this chapter and looking at this, because this is the analysis we're gonna do for the final, this is, you're going to see how things kind of, how the road kind of opens up and it kind of wends its way around. Okay, and here I was saying we have, we, we wish to always avoid type one errors or type two errors. Okay, and as you see here, the, the only thing that this slide is telling you is that if you do a t-test, you do multiple t-tests, you're going to increase the error term 
because each t-test has error within it when you do each combination. So once it starts to increase, it starts to inflate and that leads to a type one or type two error. In order to avoid that, we don't use multiple t-tests, okay? That's all that's saying and I said that earlier. Well, I want you to visualize because I want you to visualize three buckets, okay, low, medium, and high. And what the, the analysis is, isn't a T or a Z or some kind of proxy of that. It's what's called the F ratio. F stands for, is the homage that they gave to Sir Harry Fish, who was the greatest statistician of all time. That was his, that was his morta immortality. And you can tell since nobody really knows what F stands for in the F ratio, I don't know how immortal he really is. But having said that, the F ratio is the final distillation that we get after we do the entire analysis. Let me talk about this for a second. Once again, it's not to see what's different from one group to another group. It's looking at the percentage of variance between each of the groups. So what's a ratio? It's one part product, two parts water, okay? So that's what it is. One part, one part product, two parts water. It's the relationship between the variance inside the bucket versus the variance between the bucket, okay? And I'm gonna get to different examples of that. Okay, I guess I can, I can start to, let me see what the next slide is. Okay, let me talk about the buckets for a second. So we, I want you to visualize low, medium, and high. <clears throat> and I want you to visualize that in each of the buckets, you have soup, and it's a vegetable soup. And in the first bucket, you don't have many vegetables. It's more like a consomme or a broth, okay? Maybe the occasional carrot bite comes through, okay? The second bucket has more vegetables just as you would imagine a vegetable soup would have, right? It's soup and it's got stuff floating around in it. It's got different vegetables, right? That have been cut up and done in there. And the third one is a very thick stew, which they're calling vegetable soup stew for argument's sake, right? So that's what I want you to think about. That's what I want you to kind of visualize, all right? So what we're gonna look at is the relationship of what's in each of the soup buckets, <clears throat> The consomme, the soup, and the stew versus looking at them as a total bucket. So I have bucket one, bucket two, bucket three. So it's the relationship of what's within versus the relationship of what's between. That's the ratio that we're really looking at. Okay, this is more of the technical stuff that they're having here. The differences between sample means, the difference between expected with no treatment effects. It's too confusing. Okay, so if you think about it the way I'm thinking about it, <clears throat> it makes life a little bit easier for you to kind of conceptually grasp it. Three buckets of soup, a consomme, a regular soup, and more of a stew. Is there a difference between the three of them in terms of density of product? Okay, so I look at my total product of what's in each of the buckets versus each of the relationship of what's of, of the between groups. Okay. And here we start to talk about how you can't do a sample mean between two things. This is kind of laying down the groundwork and I've kind of, kind of thematically put that through everything here. You know, like once again, what's the numerator? The numerator is over the amount of variance or differences that we found. The denominator always is our playing field, okay? So this is just saying what this slide is really boiling down to is that this is the ground rules that are the statistical basis of doing ANOVA, okay? And we know all this stuff, and we know that we have to get an, uh, a numerator, we know we have to get a denominator, okay? The logic, and here's what I was talking about before with the three buckets, now kind of visualize it again, between treatments variance. And all that really means is between each of the groups. So between bucket one, bucket two, and bucket three, as a total, right? So I'm looking at the total contents of bucket one. I'm looking at the total contents of bucket two. I'm looking at the total contents of bucket three. Then I have the within treatment, 
and that's what's within the bucket. So is there a lot of variability within each of the buckets? So with the one that's more of a consomme or more without any vegetable in it, really, what are you finding? There's a lot of it, you know, to find a, to find vegetable or to find a small piece of carrot or corn or something, you're going to have a lot of, it's gonna be rather diffuse in there, okay? So let me just change the analogy a little bit to make life a little bit easier. Instead of soup, I'm gonna talk about my ridiculous aspirin study, uh, low, medium, and high, half aspirin, one aspirin, three aspirin. In the first one, when we have aspirin, what's, in the, what's the within treatment within the bucket? People who have headaches, right? So if they have a headache, what are you going to do? You're going to give them a half an aspirin. Is there going to be a lot of resolution of the headache? No, it's going to be dispersed among the people, right? So it's going to be a lot of variability within there, okay, within the low group. In the medium group, you're going to have less variation within, okay? So because more people are getting headaches resolved, there's more aspirin, okay? Everyone is resolving a little bit better. And then with three aspirins, there's less variance because everyone's headache is getting resolved, okay? So I have my first bucket, low dose, dispersion. Not a lot, of a lot of variance in there. Second one, less variance. And the third one, the least amount of variance, okay? So I have, and then I wanna look at what's going on with that variance within versus the entire bucket comparing it. So I have my within by my between. And you're gonna see that kind of play out and it kind of unfold when we start to get to some of this analysis here, okay? But it's the relationship of what's going on within the bucket versus what's going on between the bucket, okay? So we have here sources of variability. We have systematic differences, which is always what we're looking for because a systematic difference just looking at the term is going to be uh, what my independent variable is. I'm creating that, or I believe that I have my causal ability to do that. That's systematic. The unsystematic differences or the experimental error is what I wanna keep very low. So if I think about my low dose and people are dispersed, I'll have a lot more experimental measurement error in there because I cannot account for why people are not you know, resolving their headaches, okay? So within my between treatments, that's the buckets, I'll have a lot of either systematic or random uh, or experimental error. And I want more systematic difference or more systematic treatment rather than experimental error, okay? So source of variability within, this is within the bucket now, we're going to look at any of the different treatment effects that are going on inside the bucket, how dispersed or how, how close together things are, okay? So there's either no systematic differences, everybody's kind of glommed together, okay? So there's very little variance in there, or still people are just kind of dispersed, kind of blowing up a little bit, all right? So, we, so that's what this is kind of treating and looking at, as you can see. Okay, and here, and these slides kind of are, are pretty good. I, mean, I kind of like these slides. Uh, it says, here's my total variability. We know we have a total variability. And we look at our numerator, and our numerator is always what? Looking at the between treatment variant, that's the buckets, that's my numerator. That's my total differences between low, medium, and high, as I look at them as total entities. And then my denominator, my multidimensional space that I'm controlling, looks at like what's going on within each of the buckets, okay? Is there a lot of dispersion? Is there a small amount of dispersion? Once again, if I have five cats in a small apartment, I know where my cats are. You know, I don't have to worry about it. I can always get them. My playing field is quite limited. If I go to a big resort up in the Catskills with 20 acres, I let them run free that changes the scenario, right? So that changes my multi-dimensional playing field. Okay, having said that, <clears throat> well, I said that a lot, having said that. All right, I'll be mindful of it. We wanna look at our numerator versus our denominator or the relationship of what's going on between bucket one, two, and three, and then what's within the bucket. 
All right, looking at that dynamic, looking at that precision. Okay, so when we look at the F ratio, okay, and this is only like one stop on the train. If we know the null is true, it says that uh, we're not going to have a, uh, a treatment effect. Well, no kidding, you know? If we don't, if, and nothing will be significant. So it doesn't really matter. If the alternate is true, we'll have a F ratio that's going to be statistically significant, okay? So that kind of makes sense. You didn't need to be told that, right? You, you kind of like connect the dots with that, right? Okay, so if, if the null is true, that my F ratio will be not significant. If my null is, if, if my F ratio is greater than the one in the back of the book, then guess what? I have a statistical significance. Once I have a statistical significance, there's more things that we need to do. And here's where some of the complexities of this really come across. Now, this is a very confusing table here. And I'm gonna go through this, not now, I'm gonna do this on the spreadsheet and on my handwritten sheets. And, and once I give you like the Rosetta Stone and tell you how to think about this, it, this is going to be like, oh yeah, I get it. But right now it's somewhat confusing when you see number of treatments, you know, the value in each of treatments, you know, what is this G and what is this T and K sub N and all this kind of stuff. It gets to be, it gets to be somewhat confusing, but there's no single notation, right? You can kind of make up your notation as we go along. And I'm going to show you the notation that I learned. It's similar to this, but it's, you know, you could use whatever you want as long as they know what it is. Okay, so here, this is also another nice kind of roadmap, if you will, another, another, another nice diagram that kind of talks about the goals of what ANOVA does and how it lays it out kind of conceptually. You know, the end of the game is to get to figure out, is there more variance, you know, between versus within? Okay, and then we have the different calculations to do that. We're going to look at sums of squares of totals and sums of squares between and within and degrees of freedoms also in that way. And we know that degree of freedom, even though our definition is, is where we, you know, you know, diminish the amount of that way the data can vary, the degrees of freedom usually act or will always act as a correction factor right? Not allowing our data to kind of bleed across the lines that keeps us within the boundaries of precision and exactness. Okay, here, a little bit more formula kind of stuff. And when you're on your own, you know, after eating turkey and you have nothing to do, because the football games are like, you know, everyone's getting blown out, whatever, you can start to look at some of these formulae and start to enjoy your, uh, you know, your, your training with this. So we're gonna talk about this. I don't wanna get into it now. I'm gonna lay it all out for you. I have a handwritten sheet that I uploaded and uh, my spreadsheet. Okay, once again, these are more equations. They look much more complicated here than they do once I start to break them down. Okay, so I just wanna show you that these do exist and we're gonna to get to them. Degrees of freedom. Now, the one thing about Analysis of variance, I'm gonna repeat this multiple times, all right, like ad nauseum kind of thing. The one thing about degrees of freedom, uh, the one thing about analysis of variance when you're using three groups, calculations have to be done for each of the buckets or each of the groups. So if I have three groups, I have to do everything three times. If I have five groups, then I have to do everything five times. Okay, so that's why we're doing, looking at these different groups simultaneously. Now, before I get into this whole thing, just as a practical matter, how many groups do people usually use for analysis of variance? Well, it's a minimum of three. And to be honest with you, I wouldn't go larger than five. And I've seen people go up to like eight. All right, that's a little too much for me and that's a little too many turtles to herd. But five or six is, is my acceptable level, you know, before I start to say, oh, wow, there's a lot of coloring outside the lines here, okay. But that's neither here nor there. But these are the formulas that we're going to use for, for figuring out, so we do degrees of freedom 
three times. Okay, and we're going to get to what these what these symbols mean and everything. Okay, so I'm just going to move uh, past this as we partition the degrees of freedom. Okay, now we have something called mean squares. Mean squares is what is becomes our numerator in the F ratio. And this is what we eventually lead down to, to our numerator and our denominator. I know that when we're going to talk about the formula, we're going to put so we're going to breathe some life into it with actual numbers and things like that when we get into the spreadsheet, okay? So don't worry about it. So we're going to wend our way down. So we have our degrees of freedom that we've done for each of our groups. And now we're going to build something called a mean square, which is really what we build our F ratio with, okay? Uh, if the null is true, uh, we're not going to have significance. We can see that in the back of the book. and there's an F table. And once again, 0.05 on the top, run your hands down for the number of degrees of freedom. Boom. And then there's your, there's your alpha. Uh, this, mm, let's move past that for a second. Uh, the hypothesis testing with ANOVA is really what we do. You always use our same four steps. That's our standard operating procedure, where we list out the null and the alternate. And then we start to, you know, collect our data and not do anything, you know, post hoc, but only pre hoc and things of that nature. And then we do our statistical approach. You have to remember that the statistics is really at the end. That's just a process, you know, uh, as I keep saying, flat A and a slot B. Okay. So that's how that's going to work, that kind of thing. All right. So we have our hypothesis and we have all the stuff and we're almost ready to start to get into uh, the analysis itself. <clears throat> well, like every other analysis, as we've spoken about and we've chatted about and we've calculated, we've always had our value that has become statistically significant. And then what is our next step always? Our next step is always to look at some sort of magnitude of effect, right? So we have the Cohen's D and the Z, we have the estimate of the Cohen's D in uh, repeated measure and in t-test and all that. And now here in analysis of variance, we're no longer using Cohen's D, we're using something called eta squared, or you can just say eta, that'd be okay with me. As you can see, it looks like an N with like, a, with like an extra long N piece on it, okay? So you have that. Eta squared is our new version of Cohen's D. And we're gonna calculate it because we're gonna have all the values there as we start to go down. So we have a significant effect, okay? We have a significant effect like we always have from statistics. And then we start to say, what's my magnitude of effect? Now we have eta, okay? We have eta squared to give us that level of, of magnitude, okay? And here, oh, and the one thing about eta, it also tells us, it also kind of combines that R squared portion, okay? So that portion of the variance explained. So it's kind of like this whole rubric of one full, you know, like fully loaded value, fully loaded uh, metric, okay? Here, you've seen this in the literature, okay? You have uh, three levels, you know, 20 degrees of freedom, three groups, 20 degrees of freedom. Here's the F ratio. Here's the, it's the significant at the 0.01. And my eta magnitude of effect is 0.49. And that's pretty good, right? Like 49% and all that kind of stuff. That's the magnitude. So this is what it looks like in the literature. You've seen this a million times. You know, it's, and like I said, it's three groups, 20 degrees of freedom. Here's my value, my F ratio. Here's my alpha, you know, it's significant at, and here's my eta, okay? Independent measure is the assumptions. Just like with every other assumption, observations are always independent. It means that what it is is how I select them, okay? I'm not in the business of biasing the data. Population of the samples must be normal. We continually talk about this. This is a given, if you will. Our selected samples are always from a normal population unless we're told that they're not. <clears throat> 
the populations that are selected must have equal variances. That's that homogeneity of variance thing, that's that Hartley FMAC. So we make the assumption that if we're using headache people, that they're all similar in terms of their headache. If we're testing a diabetes drug, low, medium, and high dosages, we know that they're, that they're all with the same characteristics, okay? Violating the assumption of homogeneity of variance for invalid test results. Like no kidding, okay? But if you have a large enough sample, and there's ways to get around that, but that's for a different class for a different time. Okay, so we're always going to assume homogeneity of variance, unless told otherwise. Post hoc tests. Well, once we have, let's think about this for a second. Once we have our three groups, low, medium, and high, and we have a statistically significant difference, that's what we call an overall significant model. Okay, if we have a significant F ratio, that's called a significant model. But we don't know what's driving the differences, yeah? We don't know, is it low dose versus high dose versus medium dose? We don't know which combination or which bucket, if you will, are different from each other. Is one different than three? Is one different than two? Is two different than three? We don't know this. And what we do is the statistical sages created something called a post hoc test. Post hoc meaning after the fact. So you've done everything, we have a significant F ratio, we have our groups, and now we're going to figure out which ones are not like the other. So one could be similar to two, and one could be different than three, and two can be different than three. So there's all kinds of things, there are all kinds of possibilities, and all kinds of things that are going on that can affect what, what we need to know. All right, so it's not just saying I have a significant F ratio and calling it a day. It's now we have to drill down even further to say which one of those groups is causing a difference, which one is not like the other, or which three, they could all be three different ones, okay? And they start to talk about pairwise and experiment-wise and list-wise and this. I'm telling you, it's like I, I, I get a headache, okay? Okay, so we don't wanna risk type one error. The whole point of doing a post hoc, I'll get to this in a second. So let me just talk to this in English. <clears throat> post hoc tests do a special kind of T test between the, between the pairs, right? They'll do a T test, a little kind of T test between group one and group two. And they'll do a little tiny T test between group one and group three. Well, we know that T tests increase the experiment wise uh, inflation rate, right? The inflation of the air return. But the post hoc, the way it's designed and the way it's developed and all you really need to know about it is that the post hoc controls for the inflation of the air return, okay? When it does its comparisons between, the, between all of the groups, what you're going to find is that the inflation rate is covered or suppressed. That's, the, that's what a post hoc test does. Looks at the differences between the groups in pairs. One versus two, one versus three, two versus three. Okay, and here we're going to be using, in this particular case, two keys, honestly significant difference, the HST. And it looks kind of confusing. I got a Q in there. I got an HST in there. What is all this stuff? Okay, I can't tell you what is it? And you see that he has a probability of uh, less than uh, experiment-wise uh, differences. And it's like, okay, now I'm totally baffled and I'm totally confused. Okay, so is it two keys? Is, so is, the, is this particular post hoc honestly significantly different? I don't know, but yes, it is. Okay, so we're going to be doing a post hoc. And there's another post hoc called the Schaffe. And let me just give you a very brief discussion on post hoc tests and how I've kind of come up with, come up with my own reasoning for this. There's like a million different post hoc tests on and over. You have the Tuki, you have the Schaffe, you got the greenhouse geyser, you got a million of them, you got the Newman Cools. They all do the same thing. Okay, there's no way out of it. 
many ways to get to, you know, to get to Miami. They all get you to Miami. So the one that I use, the one that I was taught was called Newman Cools. Okay, that was the, that was the uh, post-hoc test that I was taught. And why did I use it? Because somebody gave me a spreadsheet that they wrote up that had Newman Cools post-hoc in it. And I could just put in some values from my ANOVA and it would tell me which pairs were significant. That's it. There's no difference between the Chaffe. There's no difference between the Tukey. They all do the same thing and yield the same results. So I don't need to know three or four or five different post hocs. All I need to know is when I read a research article and somebody does a post hoc, I know what the post hoc does and I know what it's going to be looking for. It's going to be looking to see the differences of any of the pairs that are out there. Well, is there more about ANOVA? Can there be more? Uh, yeah, I've kind of said this is kind of like a light motif. Uh, the numerator measures all of the differences between that's the full bucket, bucket, you know, low dose, mid dose, high dose, you know, it's the bucket. And the denominator is what's going on inside of the bucket. And it's the relationship between those two dimensions that ANOVA kind of tackles, that that ratio kind of collects. Uh, let's move past this. We're looking at the critical values, but that's in the book. This is more formulae. Okay, I think we're done with this. We're done with this part of it. Let me get into the spreadsheet. Uh, you know what? Uh, I think it would make more sense if I used my, use my handwritten, because that kind of has everything laid out. <clears throat> Okay, so I have um, data and I, and I don't have the group here, but if, if you look at the, uh, let me just swap this out for a second. Okay. Okay, let me tell you how the spreadsheet is set up and then we're gonna use the, uh, the yellow sheets, my handwritten sheets to kind of look at this. Let me, let me kind of run through this a little bit, okay. For some reason, I have this listed as R1, R2, R3, R4, okay? I don't know why I used R. I have no idea. And uh, it is what it is, right? Okay, so here is my raw data. Oh, maybe I use it for raw, okay. Here's my raw data. These are scores and I have four groups, yeah? Four groups. And it's gonna be the type of analysis where you know, starting off, we're always going to do a sum of squares. Okay, I know it looks very confusing and very like there's a lot of, there's a lot of spaghetti thrown against the wall here and a lot of it is stuck, but I want you to start to think about what's going, you know, we'll start to think about what's going on here. I'm gonna, I wanna go through this. So here, the first thing I wanna do is I know I eventually have to get to in the top half of this matrix, that's all I want you to be concerned with was up to line 15, as we go across, is calculating a sum of square. You can do that, right? X minus X bar squared, right? So here are the scores. So I do my low hanging fruit. T sub one and T sub two, I'm just gonna talk about this as T now, just means total. So this is just adding up this total of my raw data, right? Standing it up. So this group adds up to 30. This is 36, 48, and 54. Yeah? Okay, good to go. Now what I want to do, I can calculate the mean. I have six bodies, 30 into six is five, done and done. Now I can calculate my sums of squares, right? And here I just kind of did it this way. All right. So here my sums of squares here is 20. Added it up, found my mean did my calculation to find my sums of squares, put it right here. And as you can see, I did that for each of the groups out there. Okay, did that for each of the groups out here. So now, once I have that, I have all this done. Now I'm going to move on to my next step. My next step is I need to start to do this stuff. I wanna fill in this set of scores. 
we have small n and we have capital N, right? Capital N is what? Total elements in the study. So that's each one of these groups, just add them up, right? So I know I have six, six times four is 24, right? GT is grand total. So I'm just going to add up all of the T's and that should give me that value. Let's hold off on X squared for a second, okay? Here, K is the number of groups I have. K is what? K is four, right? I have four groups, okay? That's what we have, four groups. Now I have my small sample, each of the groups has six elements in it. So that's, that's the small n. Let's talk about this summation x squared business for a sec, because it gets a little bit, it, you just need to follow the rules. Here is x squared. Here, what I've done is I've taken all, whoops, I've taken all 24 scores, raw scores, and I put them into what we call a vector, or I made them into a column, right? And then all I've done here is, you can see I've multiplied them by themselves, right? So five times five, eight times eight, 10 times 10. And then I added it up because it's summation of X squared. Summation of, this is X squared. This is my summation of X squared. And I just take it and I put it over here, okay? So now I have these filled out. So just to, just to quickly, so we don't get too far ahead, and I know some people are going like, what is he talking about? At line 15 here, I've gotten my sums of squares, right? I've added up my column, I've gotten the mean, and I calculated my sum of squares. And for each of the groups, I do that individually, right? I did it for my second group, I did it for my third group, and now I did it for my fourth group. I calculated my sums of squares, I got my, I, I got my mean. Now, the next thing I wanna do in my terms of my low hanging fruit or filling in the whole picture, I have this that I wanna fill in. I wanna fill in this particular column set here. Okay, so I know capital N are the total elements. So the total elements means what? Each of the items, right? So that's 24 items, six items per group, four groups, six times four is 24. Or do what I do, use your fingers and toes and add up how many bodies I have in each group and just keep adding, okay? And then I have something called GT, which means grand total. So do I already have T? Yeah. So this is like summation T, but I can't call it, but they don't call it summation. So it's called grand total. So I just take all of my T values here the total of group one, two, three, and four, and just add them together. And if you look at the spreadsheet, you can see that, that they're just added together here, right? So B13, that's where my totals are. One, two, three, and four. Those are my four groups, right? Add it up. It gets a little bit dicey when we're gonna talk about the X squared in a second. K is number of groups. I have four groups, okay. I got that, I can count that, that's easy. And I have small n, which is sample elements. I have six elements per group, okay? Now I have to deal with this x squared. So what you're going to do, you're going to take, you're gonna create a vector or an array. We're gonna take each of the raw scores and you're going to put them into a column, okay? And then you're just gonna multiply them by themselves and add it up. So you're gonna call this is X and this is X squared. And you're gonna add it up and then it's gonna be summation X squared. You're gonna take that value and you're gonna drop it in here. Can you do it another way? By just saying like, oh, I'm gonna add up. Why can't I just take 30 times 30, you know, 30 plus 36 plus take my GT and just square it up? No, doesn't work that way. You have to take each of the scores, multiply them by themselves, add it up, and drop the value here. Just do it the way I'm telling you. You'll, 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 it'll be much 
easier and better. Get used to the mechanics of it for the time being. Okay, now that you have that, I'm gonna move forward, is we have degrees of freedom, we have sums of squares, and then we're gonna build our mean squares. Okay, let's just, let's talk about degrees of freedom for a second. Degrees of freedom total. Now we have a formula on this, yeah? So what is degrees of freedom total? Capital N minus one, right? And if you have your handy sheet, your yellow sheet, you can look at it too, along with me. Now I have my degrees of freedom between, because we're gonna do it three times for degrees of freedom and for sums of squares. Degrees of freedom between is K minus one. K is what? The number of groups. Four minus one is three. So degrees of freedom within, I don't have to be a genius because now this is what they call in math the modulus. So it's total minus between. So it's 23 minus three. Not that difficult, right? So degrees of freedom total, capital N minus one, degrees of freedom between K minus one, and degrees of freedom within is total minus between. Boom, so that's easy, done and done. Now we start to get a little bit more complicated here. I wanna hold off on, uh, yeah, no, I guess I should do this one. Okay, sums of square total is a much different formula. <clears throat> and it's the uh, summation x squared minus gt squared divided by n. Okay, and we're gonna, and let me just change out the screen for a second just to show you. And we're gonna go through this on the paper too, but I don't wanna lose anybody. So here, summation x squared. Okay, this should be GT in here. Okay, this is just the way I was taught, you know, it's called summation x, whatever. Okay, but this should be GT. Okay over n and that's what it's a little confusing so you got to remember it's not going to be summation x squared minus summation x squared over over n people do this all the time okay this is why i went back they swapped it out over here and you get these like incredibly insane numbers and people look at me and they go like is this right and i go no it's not so you have to remember it's summation x squared the one with the long array or the vector minus grand total squared, which is a different number than this, divided by n. Okay, so that's how we do that. Now what we're going to do is here, we're gonna go from once we figure out degrees of freedom total, we're gonna do degrees of freedom within. And degrees of freedom within is simple because all we're going to do with degrees of freedom within is we're just going to add up the sums of squares, which you can see here. And you have all the algebraic formulas there on the yellow sheet that I uploaded, okay? I laid it out there. So here, I just have to do that. So now to figure out sums of squares between, don't have to be much of a rocket scientist. So it's total minus within gives me between, okay? Not much of a rocket scientist. So I have my formula here for my sum, sums of squares total, which is the one that everybody kind of, uh, you know, takes a trip and fall on, which is summation x squared minus gt squared divided by n. So you have all the values and you have all the formula and you just need to do the plug and the chug. Well, having that, we now we have all of our elements, we have our table set to now get together our F ratio values, our numerator and our denominator, okay? So we have M mean square between. So what is the formula for mean square between? Let me turn my page here. I just want to make sure I get it right. Okay, so mean squared between is the numerator is sums of squares between 
divided by degrees of freedom between. Mean squares between this value, the numerator of the F ratio is sums of squares between divided by degrees of freedom between. So what would that mean our denominator is? It would mean it is the sums of squares within divided by the degrees of freedom. Kind of makes sense, right? Okay, so we've wended our way all the way through this. Okay, so we have our mean square, which is our numerator, which is like all our variance that we got, all the good stuff that we got for our differences. So it's the sums of squares between, this is the bucket stuff, right? Divided by degrees of freedom between, right? So this is our buckets versus of what's going on in the bucket. The sums of squares within divided by the sums of the degrees of freedom within. So we have our buckets on that. Do so you see how the buckets come in as the between and the within kind of stuff? Once we do that, we do our F ratio. The mean square between divided by the mean square within. Because we know, even if you forget which one goes on top, you know within is our denominator, right? You know within is the, the denominator. So it has to be the between divided by the within. <clears throat> we have a value. We look in the back of the book and we go 6.45 F ratio is significantly different than what's in the book, okay? Because this is why we wouldn't do anything else other than that. Now that I know that I have significance, what does that significance mean? That significance means that there is a different, that I have a significant difference in the overall model. And that's the language that they use. A significant F ratio indicates that there is a significant difference within the overall model. Now, I don't know where in the model, yeah, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna get you everything, not to worry. You'll have all that you need for, for the exam, okay? But as, as I'm kind of continuing here, it just says that we have an overall difference. Now, what did I say we need to do? Now we need to look at magnitude of effect and to see which one of these groups is driving any differences, which combination is driving differences. So we do eta right here, okay? And the eta is sums of squares between divided by sums of squares total, right? And on the yellow sheet, that's already listed out there, right? I have the formulas out there for you. So once I calculate eta, well then guess what? I know that I have 49%, if you will, and that's pretty strong, right? Almost 50% of the variance in the magnitude of effect. So I'm very happy about that. So I know that I have, I just didn't drag my finding across the finish line I know it kind of got tossed over in, in a good way. So it, it seems to be a real finding. A lot of it isn't with noise or anything. Now that I know that, well, the next thing I need to do is I need to figure out a post hoc test to see which of the pairs using my special T values in my post hoc, which of these guys is going to tell me where the differences lie between the samples. Right? Is one different than two? Is one different than three? Is one different than four? Is two different than three? So here we look and we see if you look up here, you'll see the formula for the two key. And we saw that the formula for the two key is Q times the square root of mean squares within divided by n. Okay, we saw that. You'll have that in the yellow sheet. Where did I come up with this 3.69? Who is it, what is it, and why does it vex us so? <clears throat> well, very simple. There is something in the back of the book called the Tukey table. And you look at the 0 0.05 on the top, of course, and you run your finger down to the number of groups and you run across and it gives you a value. That is your Q, okay? That's what Q is. For the final, I, of course, will give you the Q. Not a big deal, I'll give you the alpha, I'll give you Q. All right, and all you gotta do is do the plug in the chart. Now what Q does, 
All right, uh, Alyssa, I'm going to get to everything. I'm going to rerun everything. Just sit tight. Let me just let me just finish it up, and I'll, no questions will go unanswered. Okay, I'm going to get to. It. All right, so we got our two key. Okay, so now what I'm going to do with the two key is I'm going to look at, and here's how it works. I'm going to compare the means of each of the combinations, and if the mean of the combination is greater than my two key value then I have significance. Then I know that group is different than the other. So let's take a look. Group one versus group two. Five versus six, the difference is what? One. Is there a difference between one versus two? No. So I put an X there. The next group, one versus three. Five versus eight is three. Is, there a diff is three larger than 2.65? I'm gonna go with a yes. So I put a yes there, I put a Y there to indicate that there's a difference. One, the mean of five versus nine. So four, is there a difference? I'm gonna say yes. And two versus three. Two, six, and eight is two is not greater than 2.65, so I say no. So I say, from a statistical point of view, I have an overall statistical model, a significant model where there is a difference between low, medium, and high, or whatever this one, two, three, and four is. Where my differences are coming in is that there's a difference between groups one performance and group three's performance, group one's performance, and group four's performance. One versus two, there's no difference, and two versus three, there's no difference. So I talk about things at the end of the day in terms of the paired comparison, okay? So I find an overall significance with my F ratio, that tells me if there's an overall difference in the model, uh, three versus four, let's take a quick look. Three versus four, there would be no difference. Okay, maybe that's why I left it out. Three V four, and we'll give it an X. All right, so you'll have to fix that on your sheet that's uploaded, I just fixed it on mine. Okay, so you have all the combinations taken care of. So eight versus nine, not a big deal. Yes, that stands for sums of squares. Okay, so let me, okay, let me stay focused on this. Okay, and, and, and let me just kind of wend our way through this again. And then I wanna take a look at the yellow sheets, then I'll answer any questions. And then I'll wish you guys all a, a safe and healthy holiday and all that kind of fun stuff. You're going to be getting this data. You're going to be getting four row, four rows of four columns of data, and there's going to be nothing else here on this whole chart. Okay, just the labels will be there, and that's about it. First thing we always do is we know we have to calculate sums of squares because every analysis in the United States or in Europe or anywhere in this universe has to run on sums of squares. That is the universal thing here. I do my low hanging fruit. I do my first total of, I total each of the groups, right? I add up the column, I calculate the mean, then I do my sums of squares, and then I put it over here. I accomplish that and I do that and repeat it three additional times, right? So now the top half of my matrix looks the same. It's all filled in. Now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna fill in the values that make up this. I'm gonna fill in these guys. First thing I do is I look and I see a capital N, that's the total number of uh, elements in the entire structure, it's 24. GT or grand total is taking all of the totals of the groups and adding them together, okay? So we're just adding these together, 30 plus 36, 48, 54, adding it together. Now I wanna look at the number of groups K is the number of groups. I have four groups, okay? So you know, you, you, you know, you notated it, you get to go. And then small n, which is sample size, is how many elements are each of the sample groups. Okay, we have cap n and we have lowercase n. You fill them in, it's, it's six. Now we get to this number here that we have to put in. And what we have to do is figure it out. It's called summation x squared. I take each of the 24 elements, and I put them in their own column. 
And then what I'm going to do is the column next to it, I'm going to multiply them by themselves. As you can see what I've done here. Now what I've done here, I've added up that column and put the value here. Now I have almost more than half of the whole matrix done. I have my top half done. I got all my elements. And now I can go in and complete everything that's in here. I have all my chess pieces. Now I'm going to have to do degrees of freedom three times. I'm going to have to do sums of squares three times before I can get to my numerator for the F and my denominator for the F, affectionately known as mean squares. OK, first thing we do is total degrees of freedom. OK, that's pretty easy. N minus 1, right? Capital N minus 1, 24 minus 1 is 3. Done and done. Degrees of freedom between, that's relatively simple. K minus 1, that's the number of groups minus 1. And because it's math, we just figure out the modulus, as they call it, total minus between. And that's my degrees of freedom within. Done and done, nice and easy, right? Haven't, haven't stressed any brain cells yet. Now it's a little bit more difficult because now I have to do my, my sums of squares three times. The first sums of squares I'm going to do, the formula is summation x squared minus gt squared divided by n, okay? So, may, so it's this value minus this value squared divided by n, okay? And when you do that, you can see it here. Okay, I get a value. Now what I wanna do is I wanna do sums of squares within, and that's just adding up all of the different, the four sums of squares as you can see, right? So sums of squares total, I got that formula. Make sure I make sure I am very conscious of doing GT squared as opposed to summation X squared squared. Okay, GT squared, get this, add up all my sums of squares, drop the number here, and now find my modulus, if you will, 122 minus 62 is 60. Now I am good to go. Now I've really done a lot of the hard work. So I have my three degrees of freedom. I have my three degrees of sums of squares. Now I have to do my numerator and denominator. And this is going to be a relatively simple approach here to, to get the uh, F ratio. I know that my between groups is the numerator and my within group is the denominator. So <clears throat> this, the, the formula for MS, MS between is sums of squares between divided by degrees of freedom between. Okay. Sums of squares between divided by degrees of freedom between. Now I have my, my numerator. Now for my denominator, I know is the within, so I just do it with the within. So it's sums of squares within divided by sums of, divided by degrees of freedom within, and, and that's my numerator values and my denominator values. Now I put it together where I have mean squares between divided by mean squares within, and I come up with 6.45. I look at my alpha, I see that the, cal the value that I calculated is greater than the one in the back of the book. I go, there is an overall statistical significant model. So I know that there's a difference between groups one, two, three, and four, but where the difference lies, I don't know yet. You know say, right? But the next thing I need to do is because I do have significance of my overall model, I need to figure out, you know, like my magnitude of effect and my variance accounted for. How good is my finding? Did I just get dragged over the uh, finish line or did I kind of fly over the finish line? All right. So here I do this and, this, and it's the sums of squares between divided by sums of square total. You have the formula, you have all the values, you do it, it's 0.49. Well, that's 49%, that's pretty good. Okay, so I know I have a real significant finding. I know that I have good magnitude of effect. Now I need to do the uh, shell game of figuring out where is where do the differences lie between these groups? Which groups are different? Okay, and that means I need to do a post hoc test. When I do a post hoc test, 
What I'm looking at is a, a special kind of t-test that controls for the inflation rate of the error term, but still lets me know if there's a difference between them. As you can see here, it's Q times the square root of mean squares within divided by small m, okay? So anyway, you have the formula, you have all the values. I do that math, I do Q times, and I give you Q, it's on a two key table in the back of the book, where you look and you see number of groups in 0.05 and you're running the finger across, and you have that value and, do, and you just do the quick math with it, all right? You have a square root key, you do the math and you find it's 2.65. This is our criterion. This is kind of like acting like a standard deviation in a way, right? Looking at the differences between means. So I just look at the different uh, pairs. I go, okay, I look at the first pair, one versus two. What's the difference in, in uh, what's the difference? One, well, that's not bigger than 2.65. One and three, five versus eight, which is three. Yes, that's larger. One versus four, this is five versus nine, which is larger, which is significantly different. Two versus three, which is two. Difference is not, and three versus four, which is not difference, which is one. So I have two groups that are different from the others, one versus three in my pairs, one versus four. And so at the end of the day, I say an analysis of variance between the four different groups were done simultaneously. An overall statistical uh, significant model was found at the 0.05 level. And the, hold on a second. 2.42, yeah, that would be different. I and mean, I thought I, why? I think I need a vacation more than you guys. Okay, all right. So anyway, an overall statistical model was found. I have 49% of, uh, okay, let me, let, just give me one second to get through this, okay? And I'm just, going to answer all questions. I'm going to take away all confusion. So Kayla, just hang in there for a second with me. Okay. So I have an overall model difference. My, my F value, my F ratio is significantly different because I have from the back of the book, it's larger than the one in the back of the book. Then I did my magnitude of effect and I found that I have a large magnitude of effect and account variance accounted for. Now I need to do, uh, my post hoc test. The post hoc test, look at the pairs of different groups. Okay, so one versus two, one versus three, these are different pairs. I'm comparing the mean of group one versus the mean of group two, the mean of group one versus three. And, and in order for me to look at those differences to see if they're significantly different from each other, I have to create a post hoc test. Uh, a post hoc test has to be used. And that's called, the one we're using is called the two key HSD test. Honestly, significant difference. And here's the formula for it, okay? It's a Q times another set of values, which we have. Q is a value taken off a two key table in the back of the book. For our final, I'll make sure that I give you the two key value, okay? So you'll have that, not a big deal. And you'll just do the plug and the chug. Now that I have a two key value, created or calculated 2.65, what I need to do is use that as my criterion, just like as we use standard deviation to compare the group means, the paired comparisons to see if, they, if, if the difference between the paired comparison is greater than 2.65, I know those two groups are different from each other. So one versus two, the mean of one, versus the mean of two, the difference is one. Is one greater than 2.65? No. The mean of one versus the mean of three. One versus three is eight, is the difference is three. There's a difference between them, right? One versus four, five versus nine. So the difference is four, it's greater than 2.65. Two versus three, the mean of two versus three is not greater than 2.65. The mean of three and four, three versus four is not greater. 
than 2.65 and the mean and the means and the difference mean the difference of the means between two and four are different from each other. Six and nine is three. So that's greater than 2.65. So what I say overall is that there's a significant, statistically significant overall model. I have 49% uh, variance accounted for in magnitude of effect. And in my paired comparisons, one versus two, one versus three, one versus four, dot, 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 there's a difference between groups one and three, there's a difference between groups one and four, and there's a difference between groups two and four. And that's how you leave it, okay? So that's what analysis of variance looks like. Okay, what I'm gonna do now is I, I just wanna move away from here and I wanna go on to the yellow sheet and I just wanna walk through the yellow sheet very quickly and hopefully that'll answer. Then I'm gonna take field any questions that anybody has afterwards. Okay, here I start to define things. If you look at my notes that I've uploaded, uh, I have capital N, number of elements, GT, uh, you know, summation T1, summation T2, yada, 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 okay? Then here, summation X squared, every score multiplied by itself, okay? Every raw score multiplied by itself, that's that long vector or array. K. It's the number of groups. Small n is the number of elements per group. Now we've already done all the work from the other sheet. I didn't want to just copy it over for copy's sake, but I have here the formulas laid out how everything works. So degrees of freedom total, and then I have all the values put in, right? I expand it. Degrees of freedom between, number of groups minus one is three. Degrees of freedom within, total minus between, 23 minus three is 20. Here I have, now we're gonna do the sums of squares. Sums of squares total, summation x squared minus, this should be gt squared, okay, divided by n. Look at the values as, it, as, as I expand it out. 1298, which was x squared, 168 squared divided by 24, 1298 minus, this value, and then I get whatever, and then I get whatever it is here. 1298 minus 1176, 11, yeah, 11, it's 122. So I just keep expanding it out. I have all the values on the table, and I just keep throwing them in as to where they go in the formula. Okay, sums of squares between. I, I want to do sums of squares within first. So you see here, I'm adding up all the sums of squares for each of the different groups. Okay, 20 plus 20 plus 14 plus eight, I have them all. Then sums of squares between, I'm just subtracting 122 total minus within, and I have that. So now I have my degrees of freedom and my sums of squares total. What's my next step? Calculate my F ratio. My F ratio is mean squares between divided by mean squares within. Mean squares between, very simple. We have all these values. Sums of squares between divided by the degrees of freedom between. Then I just expand it out and do the plug and the chug. Mean squares within, same thing. Sums of squares within, degrees of freedom within. Boom, boom, plug and the chug. Then I just put the math together. It's always, we know the between is the numerator, the within is the denominator. So I have the values right, 20 divided by one. Well, guess what? Then I have my F ratio. It's in the back of the book. It's larger than the one in the back of the book. I have an overall statistical significant model. Okay, now what I need to do is I need to calculate eta or eta squared. And I have, a, I have a formula for that. Do I have those values? Yeah. So I just plug and chug it. So it's, you know, 60 divided by 122 comes up to 0.49. Not too bad, right? Easy. Now I go on to my last step. I have to do my Tukey. My Tukey test comes on. It's Q times mean square within divided by small case n, square rooted. I get Q from the back of the book and what's called a, Q, a Tukey table. And then I just expand it out. So I see in the back of the book, it says 3.69. 
3.69 mean squares within is 3.1 divided by the number of elements in each uh, sample is six. I do that math and then I find the square root of that and I multiply it by uh, 3.69, I come up with 2.65. 2.65 becomes my criterion, becomes my criterion when I do my, plant, my, pain, my planned comparisons, okay? And at the end of the day, I say I have an overall statistically significant model. Okay, hold on, hold on for one second. I have a, an overall statistical model, statistically significant model. We have 49% uh, variance accounted for, so I now have a strong finding. And then I say the, the, me, the differences between the means are either significant or not. And I say, one versus three is significant, one versus four is significant, and two versus four is significant. These are the ones that are driving any differences. And that's how it works. You'll have all the formulas, you'll have my matrix. You know, it won't be full, but you'll have the matrix, so you'll be able to kind of do work with that. And um, I'll give you everything you need. I'll give you all the alphas, and I'll give you all the, uh, I'll give you all the stuff. Not a big deal. All right. Any other questions? Well, uh, Kayla, so are you, uh, just let me know. Are you good? Yes. Okay. I don't want any confusion before we leave. Very good. Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions before I, I wish everybody a safe and healthy and happy Turkey Day? We all good? Going once, going yeah, twice? I have a question. Okay. We have a question. Everyone else can leave. Don't don't feel don't don't. Feel okay, then is, is your question just for me? No, it's about statistics, but oh, okay, sure. okay, yeah. Ask ask away. Um, so I have the Tuki. I don't understand where you go from the Tuki to the plan comparisons. Okay, did you calculate a Tuki uh, Tuki value? Yeah, I have the Tuki value Q times square root of MSW. Right, 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 right. Okay, and you come up with a number. Think of it as a standard deviation where you're going to compare the means. Of, of, the, of the groups in a planned way, one versus two, one versus three, one versus four. If the difference between the means, let's say of one and two, are greater than the two key value, you know that groups one, group two is okay. different. And how do you get the differences between the means? Just subtracting? That's it. Okay. That, that's it. Don't need to over uh, over, uh, overthink it. It okay. really is that kind of simple kind of thing. Okay, awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, guys, who's ever left, have a wonderful holiday. Stay safe. And I'll see everybody on the other side. So go and enjoy. Be well.